Hi guys, in this video I hope to give a short introduction to the topic of neural networks and I gave this video the title of who's afraid of neural networks because at least talking with my uni friends it seems that a lot of them are and so I hope that this video and perhaps future videos will help take away some of this fear from these mysterious neural networks. So I want to start with what are neural networks and we can look at it in a few ways. We can look at it functionally, like what do they do? And what do they do? They are basically a structure machine, a structure uncovering machine. Yeah, they are function approximators. So suppose you have some function that is very complicated and you want to somehow uncover this function through the data that you have. And so they allow you to do this. And it doesn't matter if your problem is regression where you actually have to find this regression line or if your problem is classification where you have to find discrimination surfaces or regions, uh, et cetera. And they are really good at finding compound structure. So here there's this uh, very famous picture that shows what the layers in convolutional neural networks uh, seem to be doing. So the first layers, they seem to be detecting edges or colors and stuff like this. The middle layers seem to compound these edges to more basic forms, yeah? So uh, if a few edges are together in a certain way, then maybe it's a circle or maybe it's a square or maybe it's a straight line, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final layers, they compound this middle structure to identify objects like wheels or houses and stuff like this. Okay, so this is basically all I have to say about neural networks as, as regards to what they do. What are they made of? So in my opinion, they are made of three main components, an architecture, a loss function, and an optimization technique. Whereas the architecture is where most of the focus uh, relies on, the loss is pretty much defined by the problem and the optimization is usually uh, narrowed down to one type of optimization and we will touch upon it immediately. So we saw that what are neural networks structurally, i.e. what are they made of, what do they do? Uh, maybe also ask uh, what are they in the context of the world and machine learning and statistics? So they are basically this rock star of machine learning and AI. They are very popular. They perform very well on many tasks. Um, they are also considered a black box just because they are so complex. I think that there are many other algorithms that are also complex and they are also kind of a black box, but they are the maybe flagship of black boxes. Yeah, They usually have a lot of parameters and it's impossible to really understand what's going on inside of them. So this is part of their strength, but also their weakness. It's their strength because it gives them a lot of expressivity, but it's also a weakness because it takes away a lot of the ability to interpret what is going on inside of them. And in general, neural networks seems to be something scary. Again, I talked with my friends, they are like, ah, neural networks. Um, and there's this meme I found online and I kind of like it. So what does the society thinks I do? Uh, I don't know, create the next Terminator. Uh, what my friends think I do, give computers a brain. What uh, other people think I do, make a lot of money. What mathematicians think I do, they think I just sit in front of the computer, try different things until it works and basically don't really understand what I'm doing. Uh, I have no idea what this picture is supposed to signify. If somebody knows, please leave a comment below. And what I actually do, I load up libraries that already implements everything and I just hook up everything and uh, let it run. Okay, so another question is why are they called neural networks? Okay, so where are the neurons in what I showed you here? Well, originally the, these architectures, these algorithms, they took inspiration from our own brain and neurons. So just like our, the neurons in our brain, um, our neurons only fire and communicate electricity to the other neurons if their stimulus exceeds some uh, threshold. If their input exceeds some threshold, then they fire to the next, uh, to their surrounding uh, neurons. And so very similarly, the artificial neural networks do exactly that. 
And so this is also why they are sometimes referred to as artificial neural networks to distinct them from the biological networks of neurons that we have in our brains. Okay, so let's start with the first component, which uh, we can call architecture. You can also call it a model. It basically defines a model for us. So it's a computational graph. It looks something like this in a very simple case. And it consists of these nodes. Yeah, this node is a node. Yeah, all these circles are nodes. And they are called neurons. Okay, this is why we call them artificial neural networks. And how we define these, the connection between these nodes, these computational graph, then uh, this limits the expressivity and interpretability of what we are doing. Yeah. Okay. So the first layer is usually called the input layer, and this is the input. The middle layers, in this case, there's only one, uh, is called the hidden layer. And then the final layer is called the output layer. Okay. The parameters or coefficients of this model. So this graph defines a model. And the parameters uh, of these models, in the, the context of neural networks, they are called weights. They are usually also initiated with random values. We will touch upon this in a, another video. Um, so between each layer, yeah, between the input and the hidden, and between the hidden and the output, you have these coefficients, these weights. Yeah, and we can give these weights names. So we can call this W11 uh, on the first layer, W12 of the first layer, W21 of the first layer, and W22 of the first layer. Okay, and so 11 one is because it's going from the first input, yeah, X1, uh, to the first um, uh, node in the next layer. Okay, and one, two goes from the first to the second, two, one from the second to the first, et cetera. In addition, we have a bias term. Yeah, so the bias term can be considered as if you have an extra input of one and it's multiplied by some bias. So B1 and B2 maybe. Okay, and so we take these axes and one, we multiply them by these Ws and Bs, these weights and biases, and we get some input here to these neurons, these computational neurons in the middle. And then we take them and what we do on them is we add some nonlinearity to it. So up until the entrance to this node, all the actions we took were linear. But now we want to add some nonlinearity. And what we will do is we'll use something that is called activation functions. So these are functions that are basically these threshold functions, yeah? So if you are below some level, then you don't fire, but once you're above some level, you start to fire, okay? So if you're below some level, you give zero, and if you're passing this threshold, you are starting to give some values, okay? And there are many different types, for example, a sigmoid, a tan H, or L with soft plus, uh, et cetera. So you take the input, you pass it through this activation function, you get the output, and then you rinse and repeat. Yeah. So maybe in the next layer, you have this W11 uh, of the second layer and W21 of the second layer, and you have a one here and a bias one. You take these inputs, th these outputs here. Yeah. We can maybe call them A1 and A2. You multiply it and you get the output. And usually it depends on your problem. The output might be just a linear combination, or maybe, or maybe you have to pass it through a sigmoid because you want to restrain the values, or maybe you want to take the exponent of them so that they are non-negative. It depends on what outputs you are trying to get. This is how it's represented, but in practice, instead of writing all the individual weights, we move to matrix notation. Yeah, so, yeah, so all of these uh, can be thought of as a matrix, yeah, as a W that holds W11, W12, W21, uh, and W22. And if we multiply this by X in vector notation, X1 and X2, then you can check for yourself that you get 
uh, these two nodes here, yeah, these, um, maybe we call them S1 and S2, which is the input to these nodes before we are passing the activation function. Okay, so we can write this in matrix notation as W times A plus some bias, or if we incorporate the one yeah, into the, uh, the layer, yeah, as, a, as an extra input of the layer, then we can just write it as a W um, times A. Yeah, but in practice, usually we distinct between the weights and the biases. And then uh, we pass it through some activation function, usually denoted by this lower sigma. And what it means is that for each value of the vector, yeah, this gives us a vector. And then for each element in the vector, we pass it through this activation function. And one question you might ask is why do we even need these nonlinear activation function? Well, if we don't do this, then the whole network collapses basically to one layer. Okay, so if we only have uh, linear operations without adding the nonlinearity, look what happens. So for example, let's suppose we did it, this on the first layer, and then we didn't pass through this nonlinear activation function. So we just take that, this as the output also of that layer, and then we do it in the second layer. So we multiply again by the weight matrix of the second layer, and we add the, the bias vector of the second layer. But look, this just becomes this, and then we could treat this whole thing as a new weight matrix, we call it W, and this whole thing as a new bias vector, let's call it B. So if you just stack up layers of these operations and you don't add the non-linear activation functions, everything is collapsed into basically one layer. And it's not very expressive if you don't do the non-linearity. And just let me clarify that what I'm showing you here is just one type of architecture. There are different types of architectures and we will touch upon it in the future. Uh, one final note about this architecture thingy is that it's more of an art than a science. So it's usually tailored to the specific problem at hand and it's given the problem structure. And so if you're working on a certain problem, you will have to maybe tweak the architecture to a certain way. And there are many papers that try to think what is the best architecture to a given problem. There are competitions that try to uh, basically create these benchmark problems where you can uh, find the best architecture and every year people are getting better and better results. But yeah, it's more of an art than a science. You have to try and feel your problem and try to find the architecture you think uh, is best for your problem. And there are what are called universal approximation theorems that basically say that even a neural network with one long enough hidden layer, it can approximate any function. So you don't really need uh, to have more than one layer. Um, there's new research also being conducted uh, when it's theoretically good to go deeper under which conditions. But in practice, for example, in cases where there is this compound structure that you want to uncover, um, stacking up layers and doing what is called deep neural networks uh, seems to work better. Um, there are many types of architecture. The three most famous ones are the deep neural networks or the feed-forward neural, neural networks or the multilayer perceptron. And this is a very simple version of it that I showed you here. There is also what is called convolutional neural network. This is used mainly for images. And what it does, it leverages the local structure uh, and help to reduce the number of connections needed. And one of the benefits of it is that it's invariant to translation. So for example, if you want to find a circle it, in an image, it doesn't matter where the circle is, you still want to identify it. And by basically limiting yourself to local structure, uh, creating filters that only look at local structure and then convolving these filters around an image, for example, uh, helps to identify uh, if the image contains a circle or is, is it containing a bear, a cat, a dog, etc. There's also what is called recurrent neural networks, and they are used mainly for time series or also for audio and text. Actually, with the rise of the transformers, I'm not sure this is uh, 
still the case. I think the popularity of RNNs is going down. Uh, but in a nutshell, what they do, they sort of accumulate state and they have this sort of memory where you uh, get new information all the time and you update your state and you give uh, better prediction or better classifications, et cetera, given this new information. Uh, this constraint where you can't look to the future, you can only look to the past, kind of makes it uh, harder for these neural networks to train. So this is one shortcoming that they have and also a reason why transformers, uh, which solves this problem, are gaining more and more popularity. And there's a lot of other types. There's GANs, autoencoders, transformers, Boltzmann machines, RBF networks. There is this page called the Neural Network Zoo. You can Google it. Uh, it has a lot of different architecture and it explains a little bit about them. Okay, so this was the first component, this model defining architecture. The second component is what is called loss, also called cost, error, objective. It has a lot of names. And so the output of a neural network can have one output, it can have many outputs, but usually what we want is to kind of squish everything down to a single number that tells us how good our network did. And so usually we take this output and we calculate from it a loss. So for example, if our problem is regression, we might have the actual uh, value of Y of our target in that certain X. Yeah, for that certain X, we have a certain Y. And we have what our neural network predicted to be the Y for that X that we fed through it. So we want to know how good it is. Let's take the distance and square it. Yeah, so this is why it's called the squared error. For classification, a common uh, loss that is used in the case where we only have uh, two classes and what is called binary classification is the binary cross entropy. And this term, you can see that, for example, if your Y is belonging to the class one, then this term disappears and you're only left with the minus log, the neural network will give you a prediction between zero and one. And the closer it is to one, the loss is smaller, the closer it is to zero, your loss uh, explodes. And if Y is zero, you get the same only from these terms. Often some form of regularization is added to the loss for a few reasons, but the main I think is to prevent overfitting. Okay, so we have this architecture uh, that gives us an output. We take this output, uh, we put it in our loss, we get a number, and now we want to somehow optimize this loss to minimize this loss. And what we can change are the parameters, the weights of this neural network, of this architecture. And so this is usually called training, but what it actually is, is optimizing, yeah? So it's optimization. Uh, we want to optimize this objective function, this loss, uh, given our data and given the model, and the knobs that we can turn are the weights. So the most often optimization algorithm that is used is stochastic gradient descent, usually some heuristic form of it with momentum. And there are a few reasons for this. The obvious reason is that this neural network usually, if it's complex and long enough, doesn't have a closed form solution. If it had a closed form solution, we would prefer just to solve it and get the perfect weight, but it doesn't, it's too complicated. Another problem is that it's also non-convex. So the problem, because of all this non-linearity that we added, uh, is not convex, which also means that using gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent does not guarantee us to converge to the true solution. We could get stuck on what is called local minimas and not get out of it. Okay, so gradient descent means that we are taking steps uh, in the direction of the gradient, actually the minus the gradient. And the question is how big are the steps? The quantity that determines how big the steps are is called the learning rate. So if you have a big learning rate, you take big steps. If you have a small learning rate, you take small steps usually you need to find some balance. If you take too small, you might, it might take you a long time to converge. If you take too big, you might uh, miss uh, the actual local minimum. We can't do full gradient descent because usually we have too much data. And if we have too much data, we can't fit it all into memory. 
So what we do, we break it into chunks and we do gradient descent only on that chunk. And these chunks are called batches in the context of neural networks. And if you ran over all the chunks of your data once, this is called an epoch. So you finished one epoch of training. And in the end of each epoch, usually there are ways to check, did the neural network converge? Is it improving or, are we, or have we reached the best we could do? And if it's still improving, we continue. If it's not improving, we usually stop. Another question is why are we using gradient descent and not second uh, order algorithms like Newton algorithm or quasi-Newton algorithms? The answer that I could find is that the Hessian is usually too hard to compute. Yeah, so the calculating the Hessian is of order uh, squared the number of parameters. And in neural networks, you usually have a lot of parameters. So this is usually uh, very hard. It is possible. And I saw that uh, frameworks also offer uh, ways to compute the Hessian. Another reason I think that second order methods are not used is that, that the more advanced first order methods like RMS prop and Adam, uh, they are very competitive also with the second order uh, optimization algorithms. But you could also do second order optimization. Again, usually what, what is being done is SGD. Okay, some form of SGD with momentum, Adam or RMS prop. And this is an active field of research. Uh, three years ago, I think Adam was the most uh, popular and the best. And I think a year ago, I saw an article that says that there's a new winner. So there's constant research and advancement also in this field. And sometimes certain problems work better with certain algorithms and other problems works better with other algorithms. Okay, so as the name suggests, uh, if we do gradient descent, we have to find the gradient, which also means uh, we need metrics calculus. So, so when we move from this individual representation to this uh, matrix and vector form representation, this is where linear algebra is important. And the second thing that is important is uh, matrix calculus or calculus in general, uh, because we need it to calculate the gradients. Usually there's this distinction between moving the inputs forward in the computational graph in this architecture. And this is called forward propagation. And then computing the gradients going backward in the graph. And this is called backward propagation or back propagation for short. But actually, uh, I will show maybe in a future video that we could have done everything just going forward. It's just more computationally efficient uh, in certain cases, where it's usually the case when you have a loss function uh, to separate it into two parts. And one final note is that training the neural networks uh, is a really hard task. It's known to be a really hard task because you can get stuck on many local suboptimal solutions. As I mentioned, it's non-convex. There are local optima that can be quite bad. OK, another question is, is it the best tool in the box? So uh, is it proved that neural networks are the best? They are doing the best. And surprisingly, no. So it turns out that at least in one uh, metric that is called the minimax IMSE, it doesn't matter what it is right now. It's just a metric uh, to help us uh, decide which algorithm is better. Uh, other algorithms are doing just as well. For example, there's something called projection pursuit. There's, there's another set of models called the multi-index models, et cetera. So a good question is why is neural networks so popular? why everyone heard of neural networks, but probably no one heard of projection pursuit. Um, I'm not sure, but again, neural networks seem to work really well when you have this compound structure. And actually, I think also in terms of this minimax IMSE, if you assume you have this compound structure, they work better. Uh, I'm not sure about that though. And compound structure seems to be really the problems that humans solve. So for example, when you understand images, uh, it could be that our brain works this way, that we first put together edges, then make simple shapes, and then from these simple shapes make more complex shapes. Text and speech are the same. So text, we could see letters, and the letters are compounded into uh, words, and the words are compounded into uh, sentences, and the sentences are compounded into paragraphs, and the paragraphs into, into pages, and pages into chapters. And every time we go up, this hierarchy, 
a new meaning emerges and a new understanding emerges. So these are the problems human are good at solving where you have this hierarchy of structure and neural networks seem to also be very good at that. Another reason is computer architecture. So computer hardware and especially GPUs. So from what I understand until the eighties and nineties, neural networks were not so popular and they did not perform so well, partially due to lack of good hardware, maybe also lack of research. But then with GPUs, it accelerated the popularity of neural networks. This also kind of implies that uh, neural networks are the winner or the rock star now due to hardware limitations. So maybe with different hardware, future hardware, other algorithms might be the winner. Just uh, something to think about. Another reason is that maybe they have better code implementation. So there's a lot of uh, frameworks that help you implement neural networks. There's Torch, TensorFlow, et cetera. I'm sure there's reasons I missed. If you know any, please leave them in the comments. Uh, and maybe also it's not so justified that they are so popular. Maybe projection pursuit is actually better, but no one heard of it. I don't know, I'm not an expert. Anyway, this is all for this video. I hope it uh, gave you a good introduction to this topic and uh, made you a little bit less afraid of neural networks. And in future videos, we will go deeper uh, and look more in depth into neural networks. So I hope you enjoyed this video and see you in the next one.